Hello, my name is Anthony Truman Jones, and I have been playing Dungeons and Dragons for nearly 40 years. Over the next 17 minutes, I shall briefly explore the varied history of Dungeons and Dragons, as well as look at how much it's affected modern age pop culture. I can I see Corin in my dark vision. Yeah. What's he doing? He's walking off towards that. I pick up a bit of rubble, throw it at him. <laughs> I'm not actually oh. trying to hit you. I'm trying I'm to get you. We have to stay out of that zone. Otherwise, we can't cast our spells. Do you roll to, to hit? Yeah. I did warn you. 21. Yeah, you hit him. As he turns towards you, the thing comes out up behind him. I'm going to charge. Yeah. Roll for initiative. Turn the clock back 10 years or more, and this game of Dungeons Dragons would have been played out in secret, hidden in basements or in out of sight kitchens. In darkly lit rooms, friends would gather around a table with their large pizza boxes unending snacks and cans of explosive drinks, each pretending to be an all-powerful wizard, a reckless barbarian, a holy paladin or a sneaky rogue, never admitting their addiction to the public, afraid that they would be ridiculed or worst put under the same banner as cultists or drug addicts. And yet amazingly, according to the BBC, an estimated 20 million people were playing it all around the world in 2004. Why do you play it? Uh, I think it's the fact that you get so emerged in your own character in the world that you kind of don't want to stop. Yeah. Like you get you get attached to your character, but it's weird because that the character's not there and there's no visual representation of yeah. your character unless you have a, a figure. But it's the fact of you can imagine what's going on. Like it's like a movie in your head, and you like anything can happen, and that's that's the best part about it. Dungeons and Dragons or D&D to the Initiated, was created by Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson back in 1974 and is undoubtedly the most successful role-playing game to ever exist. The game allows a group of players to live in a fantasy world where the sky is the limit as to what they can do. There are no boards, no tiles, no clock, all they need is a couple of pieces of paper, six different polyhedral dice, a pencil, a rubber and most importantly an active imagination. One of the players is the referee, and is called the Dungeon Master, or DM for short. The DM is primarily the narrator, or god of the world. They control all the villains, the monsters, as well as all the other characters the players may meet during their adventure. A single game can last anywhere between a couple of hours to up to ten or more years. There literally is no limit. Unfortunately, it didn't take long for the game to become linked to devil worshipping and other occult stigmas from those who did not understand. Good evening. Tonight we begin with a story about make-believe adventure and real-life violence, and what some critics fear is a connection between the two in a game called Dungeons and Dragons. But increasingly, parents and psychiatrists are warning that the game is taking some children too far into the realm of dark and violent fantasy. They wonder whether for some children, Dungeons and Dragons becomes more than just a game. In 1979, a teenager called James Dallas Egbert III went missing from Michigan State University. Understandably, the distraught parents hired a private detective called William Deer to search for their lost son. Mr. Deer found in James's bedroom copies of the Dungeons and Dragons rulebooks. And although he had a rudimentary understanding of role-playing games, he put the blame of James's disappearance down to playing Dungeons and Dragons. It turned out that James was actually suffering from a number of illnesses, including depression and drug addiction, and had disappeared during one of his self-harm episodes. He had used the utility tunnels beneath the university to hide in, which Mr. Deer had alluded to his D&D interests. Alas, James later died in 1980 due to a self-inflicted gunshot wound. This incident led to a number of articles and books to be written, one going so far as to be made into a movie called Mazes and Monsters, starring a young Tom Hanks as the main character. Robbie! Pardue, what are you doing? Going to join the Great Hall. You can't, it's a trap. I have spells, I'm going to fly. You don't have enough points, I am the maze controller. Maze con- maze controller? Yes, and I have absolute authority in this game. Game? Game. DJ, what am I doing here? Kate, why can't I remember? Unfortunately, James's death was not alone. There are those who are fearful that the game in the hands of vulnerable kids could do harm. 
and there is evidence that seems to support that view. Timothy Grice, 21, shotgun suicide. The detective report noted, D&D &D became a reality. Daniel and Stephen Irwin, 16 and 12, a murder and a suicide. The police said they were obsessed with the game. James Allen Kirby, 14 years old, charged with killing his junior high school principal and wounding three other people. Police are blaming D&D. &D. Jeffrey Jaklovich, 14. Stephen Loyacano, 16. Michael Dempsey, 17. And the list goes on. In 1982, another teenager, Lee Pulling, committed suicide. Lee was part of a games club that were playing D&D &D at school that was being run by the school's principal. After Lee's mother had failed to place the blame on the principal, she turned her anguish against the publisher of D&D at the time, TSR Incorporate. This too failed, as it was clear that Lee was a troubled teenager who had problems fitting in. As Dieter Sturm of TSR Inc. said in a 60 minute TV special, We see no connection for the fact that right now there's some three to four million players of the game uh, actively throughout the United States. Uh, right at this particular time, uh, 1985, teenage suicide is, is epidemic across the country with some 5,000 kids a year now taking their lives. Um, I think that uh, to say that uh, because that child uh, played Dungeons and Dragons, uh, who's to say that that child does not watch television, does not participate in, in high school sports or what per se? Mrs. Pulling refused to accept this and put the full blame onto the game, stating that It has been linked in suicide notes, police reports and coroner's reports. There have been recently a couple of accidental killings, one in particular uh, related to the game where the boy thought he was a god, therefore he begged his brother to shoot him to prove that he was deified, and in fact, of course, the boy died. In 1983, Mrs. Pulling formed a group for concerned parents called BAD, bothered about Dungeons and Dragons, and started campaigning against the game. From here, it just escalated and was soon hated and feared by most parents in America. Even as recently as 2010, the United States Court of Appeals continues to uphold a ban on D&D at the Walpen Correctional Institute due to fostering the inmates' obsession of escaping from real life, as stated by Captain Muraski. Ironically, it also cemented its popularity with the younger generation and quickly became the most successful game of its time. Interestingly, some of those younger geeks and nerds from the 1970s and 80s have now turned out to be today's top game designers, John Carmack, John Romero, the authors, Stephen King, George R. R. Martin. Film directors, J.J. Abrams, John Favreau, Steven Spielberg. Actors, Vin Diesel, Dame Judi Tench, Robin Williams. And talk show hosts, like Stephen Colbert, to name just a few. As Chris Perkins, one of the principal story designers for Dungeons & Dragons, stated in this interview with Forbes. The people who grew up playing earlier editions of the game are now in very influential positions and are sort of the, the leaders of cultural movements now in the world. They're running companies that are driving game experiences that are getting out there to millions upon millions of fans. There are people who work at Blizzard, there are people who work at Cryptic, there are uh, people who work at Bioware and in Hollywood. It is now considered by many that without the success of Dungeons and Dragons, many of the games and films we have today wouldn't exist. One example is how modern computer games are structured. The most basic character, regardless of his environment, will always work towards leveling up, looking after its health, apply skills and ability stats to succeed in its goal. These are but a few of the building block elements used in computer games that can be directly placed at the feet of Dungeons & Dragons. How long have you played Dungeons & Dragons? Over 30 years. And who introduced you to Dungeons & Dragons? To bought the Red Box. So you taught, you taught, no one taught you? It's just... uh, it was a group of us and we started playing that. With the arrival of the internet, the image of Dungeons & Dragons started to change. Have you ever heard of Dungeons and Dragons? Yeah. And what do you think it is? A game. What kind of game? Board game. Would you ever be interested in playing it? Yeah. In 2008, Christopher Perkins and James Wyatt, two of the lead designers in Dungeons and Dragons, decided as a promotional gig to gather a group of internet stars whom they knew had an interest in D&D. &D. These players were invited to play a game that was to be recorded via a podcast to primarily show new players how to play Dungeons and Dragons using the new 4th edition rules. These stars were Jerry Holkins, Mike Krahulik, and Scott Kurtz. Jerry and Mike wrote and produced a webcomic called Penny Arcade, while Scott was the writer and artist of a webcomic called PvP. Both were extremely popular online and had large followers. I saw your name. Did you choose, did you choose a name? Yeah. What is your name? 
I'm Jim Dark Magic. Yo, come, Jim. I'm from the New Hampshire Dark Magic. <laughs> it's a long line. <laughs> Eastern. It's a very renowned family of magicians. No, listen, I'm Seriously, you have you never heard of the Dark Magic? Family? No. But well, I'm. Well, we're kind of a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> In the Dark Magics. Yeah. But, well, listen, I'm gonna need I'm gonna need to make a name that is twice as ridiculous just to make up for Jim. The success of this rudimentary podcast soon garnered the attention of a gnomes actor called Will Wheaton of Stand By Me, Big Band Theory, and Star Trek The Next Generation fame. He quickly joined the team, who are now calling themselves Acquisitions Incorporated. The sudden growing interest of the podcast soon had the organisers take it to the next level by putting the players in front of a live audience in a small conference hall at PAX Prime in 2010, an annual convention for gamers. Although the rules weren't popular, the live session was an instant hit, tapping into the comedic instincts of the players. I'm going to hit uh, Citrine with a Sunstrike. I know, idea. I know you heard of us. Just nail it. Right. Yeah. No, yeah. no, no, not a one. That's good. Not a one this time. Indeed, it's a 21. Against, against Reflex. That hits her. Hard. All right. So, Sunstrike, as you know because you invented this game, <laughs> um, she takes 12 points at the outset. So that's max dice, I'm okay with that. But I also slide the target one square off of the fucking disc. Yeah! Yeah! Into the acid. Yeah! Realizing that the current rules weren't working, Wizards of the Coast used the success of the live show to try out new rules. In 2014, Wizards of the Coast released the fifth edition, and it has since become the most successful release to date. Interest of the characters of Acquisitions Incorporated, AI for short, and their ridiculous adventures overtook at a crazy rate and became the main attraction at the PAX conventions, which ironically were designed for console gaming. Okay, so I remember when- Somebody might want to keep watch outside. That's a good idea. Jim? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, sure. I'll go, I'll go outside the curtain and keep an eye out. Here, so, so I can still hear what's going on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, as soon as you part the curtain, you uh -huh. see a hulking figure standing on the other side. Of it. I quickly close the curtain. <laughs> In 2017, Acquisitions Incorporated went live via a number of sold-out cinemas around America where they broadcasted their latest game. The popularity of AI quickly spawned a flood of other D&D gamers to show off their homemade games via the YouTube and Twitch channels allowing players from around the world to watch and follow these games. Hello everyone, and welcome to tonight's episode of Critical Role here, where a bunch of us nerdy-ass voice actors play Dungeons and Dragons. Damn it! Damn it! It was perfect! No, I got it right this time. <laughs> a group of famous voice actors start up a new game called Critical Role in Los Angeles. An all-girl team called Misclick started their show online in America. In Britain, a group of friends started up their own game calling themselves High Rollers. Around the world, other groups suddenly appeared. The Adventure Zone. Harmon Quest, Force Grey Giant Hunters, Nerd Poker, Drunks and Dragons, Friends at the Table, D20 Babes, and Dice Camera Action. These are just few of the channels that have garnered dedicated followers and are making waves in the community. Your old fashioned nerd or geek was now becoming as famous as some sportsmen or actors, as attested by the Netflix runaway hit Stranger Things. Another area that surprised me was that D&D was right in the military. When interviewed for the Dungeon Plus magazine, Matt James, a decorated soldier during the Iraq War and current designer for Dungeon Dragons, stated that One might think that there would be a focus of combat or aggressive adventures during a and d game, but honestly I had just as much interest in political intrigue and exploration. Role-playing, I feel, transcends a lot of cultural boundaries and that's one of the reasons I love participating as much as possible. During the downtime, when tensions were high, a lot of the soldiers would gather in groups to play D&D as a way to relieve their anxieties. Matt went on to say, Like most of my experiences in the military, I found that cultural, racial, and situational circumstances melted away as everyone enjoyed each other's contributions to the shared story experience. One final and possibly the most important development of D&D and its resurgence is the positive benefits on how it is helping those in need. Children and young adults who suffer from social and mental disorders, who are introvert and have problems with basic learning, are being brought out of their shell when given a chance to roleplay their own character. Unlike other games where you are in competition with other players, the only way to ensure a successful outcome is if all the players work together. The most important piece of advice any D&D player will tell you, don't split the party. 
Ironically, some churches and social clubs have taken up special sessions where they encourage children to join together and explore the mythical and sometimes biblical worlds in a D&T environment. Troubled children and teenagers soon forgot their problems when they joined in the quest to battle the terrifying Medusa. Ages had become irrelevant and friends were easily made. As Rob Gruber of Home Times Games in Canada said, We don't dumb anything down and we encourage the older kids to help and be patient with the younger ones. In some cases, we'll have 17-year-old boys defer into an 8-year-old girl because her character is more powerful and experienced in the game. Parents have approached these organisers, thanking them for their assistance and praising the differences they have seen in their child. Not purely because of the game of D&D, but because it helped their child make friends and to not be afraid and to dream again. As Rob Gruber stated, If you can get a player at the table, you'll have a gamer. And if you make the parents see the value of the game, you win. Nathan Stewart, who is a Dungeons & Dragons brand director, said in an interview with Forbes, My favorite uh, thing I've ever read about Dungeons & Dragons was a mom uh, who wrote this op-ed piece about how Dungeons & Dragons taught her how to communicate with her autistic son uh, because it gave her, taught her the framework and gave her son boundaries. And for the first time ever, they were able to sit down for a couple hours and really communicate back and forth. And Dungeons and Dragons enabled that. And I think when you have a something that is so special and touches people on such an emotional level, uh, it's always going to be popular. And I think right now people are just craving more and more of that connection with other people. For the days of fear and suspicion, Dungeons and Dragons has ridden through its own trials and tribulations, finally emerging as a victorious golden creature in myth. No longer is it considered a pathway towards evil and devil worshipping. It is now a way to connect to our troubled children, to help those who are in distress, and most importantly of all, to have fun, to be sociable, and to make friends. Now let loose your imagination, and let's have an adventure. As you creep past the huge sleeping red dragon, you suddenly stop as you detect a slight movement from the side. The dragon's eye cracks open, and you find yourself staring into its ageless depths. for initiative.